So hello and welcome everyone to this latest edition of the Educational Research Seminar Series. Um, we're very uh, happy today to welcome Fran Myers and Hillary, Dr. Hilary Collins um, to the department, at least to the department via Zoom for this seminar. Um, I'd like to start by saying officially that the seminar is being live streamed for students, staff and other interested parties. Um, and it is being recorded. Um, that recording will be available uh, via the department's YouTube channel and then put up uh, from there onto the department's website. Um, so please do be aware of that. Um, there are a number of ways in which you can interact with the seminar. One of the more obvious ways is that you can use the chat function in Zoom. I can see a number of people are already doing that. You can use that throughout, um, but equally you could use that to ask questions at the end and I can read them out for you if you're not comfortable doing that. Alternatively, if you want to ask a question yourself, then please just towards the end of the seminar say so in the chat and I'll um, try and call everyone who's um, wanting to ask a question to actually ask a question. Um, and the standard way in which we run these seminars is to ask all attendees to switch off their camera and mute their microphone during the presentation. Of course, if you want to ask a question at the end, you'll need to unmute your uh, microphone and turn your camera on for that period of time. Okay. So uh, I'm very happy that we can uh, make a start. Um, today's seminar is called Uberizing Higher Education teaching identity work behind the digital curtain. We've got um, two speakers today, Fran Myers and Dr. Hilary Collins. Fran Myers works at the University of Manchester Alliance Business School, and Fran's research interests include myth-making and shared narratives in public and social life during times of change and crisis. Fran's also interested in identity story-making in workplace and organizational life. Hilary Collins is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Business and Law at the Open University. Hilary's main research interests are in the area of identity and its synergy with the built environment. Uh, most recently, Hilary's research projects have included investigating sustainability and social innovation and its influence on the role of the professional designer alongside the role of design thinking within strategic design management. So thank you to both Fran and Hilary, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you, Brett. Thank you, Dee, and thank you, Kayungmi, for having us today. We're delighted to be here. Um, my broadband connection is slightly better than Hilary's today, so I'm going to take the first part of the presentation. I will um, see if Hilary has a better connection about halfway through, and if not, I'll carry on with the, um, the presentation. So thanks everybody for coming. Our presentation today is called Uberizing Higher, Teaching Identity Work Behind the Digital Curtain. And the photograph you can see there is um, we, a symbolic photograph of an empty corridor, um, one of the photographs we took during our ethnographic study um, to show students not in the student environment but rather sitting at home online so that will give you a sort of taster of what we're going to talk about today. Okay um, there's a bit of an odd context to this particular presentation. Um, we had scheduled this talk for this time last year um, at, a little bit later during March um, so obviously Covid uh, notwithstanding we're, we're delighted to be back now what that's actually meant is the events of covid have overtaken us so what we've done um is we've got a two-part presentation to for you today um the first is around our original presentation um and the second is some work that we started to do going forward um to see what is happening for lived experiences of lecturers online um as we're all experiencing now um, during the pandemic situation. So that's a con so it's really a presentation in two halves. Uh, the good news for us is since our initial presentation was scheduled, uh, the paper has now been published in Teaching in Higher Education, and that's called Behind the Digital Curtain, 
a study of academic identities, liminalities and labour market adaptations for the Uberization of HE. So we were delighted that was accepted um, for a good journal. As I say, we're quite aware that the landscape has changed dramatically again since the first study that we're going to be the first part of today. So we'll talk first of all around the initial study, the advertised presentation, and then the second bit will be an overview of our current project on teaching in the time of COVID. Uh, what's interesting for us now is that when we were reporting last um, certain um, behaviours and liminalities and states of being were starting to emerge with past dependencies for those members of staff who had been put into the digital context. But what we are obviously hearing now is um, a lot of calls to build back better uh, now that everybody um, has had this experience of a Zoom life. Um, so we'll be an opportunity to sort of unfreeze those changes, um, see what we learned in the pandemic about online teaching, what worked, what didn't work with a far bigger group of people able to um, contribute to this really, really important debate. So um, our first series of questions were really what it meant to teach in a digitized and neoliberal environment. I know that everybody here will be very familiar um, with neoliberal teaching environments in university, but perhaps for those who um, have done less um, online work, the two have been rolling together for certain members of staff for probably the best part of 10 years now, um, as opposed to the brand new experiences that people are seeing now. So what we wanted to look at was how academic identity was changing, developing, perhaps being threatened or evolving, um, and how people working in these digital environments were making sense of a situation within that new public management um, environment. Um, we saw a rising variety in a hodgepodge of short term and precarious contracts um, that people were experiencing as part of those moves um, alongside disruptive digital innovations uh, with their corresponding activities, pre online prep work um, and always onlineness and those impacts to people who perhaps have worked face to face previously, but they are now tr transitioning to an online identity, an online space and an online world for teaching. <laughs> In terms of a brief use of our methods before we go into more detail later, we used a combination of interviews and photographic ethnography for insight into behaviours and legitimations um, of those experiences underway. We used um, two universities, um, one that we have both worked in and another where we were very grateful to be invited to be um, guests for a period of time. We did certainly sing for our suppers with a series of invited lectures um, and joined in with a variety of department meetings while we were there. So we were lucky enough to spend some serious time um, in Sconston and another university um, to do some research work at the same time. Um, and a little bit about the discourses that we encountered in terms of alienation from a previous state of face-to-face -face teaching, liminality and change, and responses to imposed digitization of teaching in many cases. So that's a little bit about um, what we saw in the background before we got underway. So in terms of the introduction to the paper, talking briefly about those two universities, um, they were quite different. Um, we called them Uni A and Uni B for reasons of confidentiality. The first had a fully integrated digital curriculum. Um, it was a planned strategic move um, uh, with an object to sort of leverage um, those technological innovations as hard as they possibly could to get as many students through the door as possible. Um, University B, um, very much a traditional face to face campus, but not wanting to be left behind. Um, offering it online as a, well, we have to do this because it's important um, and doing this sort of blended experience to complement a traditional campus environment for students. So two quite different drivers, 
Um, but both we found strategically in terms of the strategic papers we read and um, talking to senior staff members, both were positioning their digital environments as part of this holistic student experience that we hear so much about um, in our universities at the moment. Um, and we noted in both a great deal of procedural compliance growing by the year um, and metrics applied to staff to drive that strategy um, and that accompanied um, the numbers of people who were on fixed or short-term contracts, daily contracts, um, almost hourly contracts in some respects or pockets of work with no guarantee of future work or no guarantee of anything beyond that, that semester. So a variety of stories coming through. Um, there was a variety of impact we felt in choices for students in terms of setting out exactly who was being offered this sort of learning and what sort of learning would be envisaged. Um, and although our focus of the paper was on what was happening to lecturers, we were quite aware um, that what we were seeing were drivers towards skills for employment and getting along in the future, rather than perhaps a traditional idea of gaining knowledge, experience and insight as part of a university um, time for students. So quite a different um, output. What we saw were effectively multi-tiered workplaces. Um, there were the haves and there were the have nots in terms of the lecturing staff that we spoke to. Um, and certain terms and conditions were quite different for ostensibly doing the same job. And we wanted to pick apart what was being offered to those people and what that actually meant for them as individuals. Okay, so our early questions is that we noted that there's an awful lot out there. Um, you only have to look at times higher um, or the rising tide of commentary and academic papers um, about aspects of precarity um, for those people working in higher education right now. But those I, um, aspects of precarity of lecturers working many hours, many, many partial contracts, um, despite their high qualifications, seeing a great deal of job insecurity, the questions about material issues um, and precarity were rather obscuring the questions about what that meant as a state of emotion and the identity work that was going on there. Um, and we also found that those issues of digital equivalence that were being pushed quite hard in universities in the sense of if you're an online student, you will get an equivalent experience to a student who is attending face to face. Um, that raised a lot of questions about digital labour um, and whether those envisaged and constructed roles um, that had sprung up to cope with this growth in a digital sphere, whether organic or strategic, um, were those roles appropriate? Were they envisaged correctly? Uh, and where, where were they leading staff, um, whether deliberately or not? Um, in terms of the strategic outlook, we saw some real positives. Um, it's not to say it's a negative environment per se. We saw people um, both uh, being advertised and responding with comments about the international reach, the opportunity to connect internationally, to work internationally and to um, intermingle with students from very different um, social and cultural backgrounds from our own. And people felt that was very positive. And we also saw spatial and temporal flexibility, the ability to sit on a beach in Greece, if you like, um, and teach, um, to teach in the middle of the night, if that suited you, um, not to be tied to a, um, a fixed classroom environment in many cases. Um, the second set of implications were rather more contestable um, in terms of reported loneliness um, in the sense of losing those institutional belonging rituals, whether that's going to the water cooler, getting a cup of coffee, seeing people in the corridor and having a chat, even perhaps seeing an advert for a lunchtime seminar that you could attend, you'd miss these physical connections. Um, but there was also another one about this sort of ever-present 
online because there was no dividing line. Uh, and I'm sure many, many people will relate to this one right now in a pandemic world because there's no putting your coat on and going home. Um, there was a sort of well, you could just drift off into the evening um, and work away and perhaps nobody would notice. Um, some very negative associations were loss of communities of practice, people working together, people um, collaborating together and developmental opportunities, which we'll explore later on in terms of once people had entered the digital sphere, um, they were missing out on those little conversations that can lead to so many opportunities to research and teach together that were perhaps offered to their colleagues in a face-to-face -face environment. Um, we felt that, that, that what we saw was a growing normalization of digital spaces. Um, we ran across and very much embraced an idea of digital enclosure. I don't know if anyone's heard of that term. Can you give me a thumbs up or a, if, if anyone's familiar with that term? No, that's okay. Um, what we saw was a sort of um, a, a re-embracing from certain academics of some of Marx's ideas about enclosure um, and about what a digital commons might mean uh, in the sense of when the internet first uh, launched as a way of teaching, um, it was embraced by those very enthusiastic academics who rushed out to seize the opportunities it could bring. But over the last few years, what we've seen um, is a buttoning down of freedoms online, um, a changing of what's acceptable online as the sort of wild west of what goes on online is starting to be brought under control, certainly um, in terms of um, the policies of Joe Biden this week, where he is looking at revoking Article 230 um, in the Media Communications Act of 1996, where if he does that, what it will mean is that platforms will be able to be sued for content that people put on, such as Facebook um, and Twitter, etc. So what we're starting to see now is um, an enclosure and an encroachment of what was originally a very um, free space as norms and standard behaviours for what is acceptable and what is not acceptable online start to be buttoned down. Um, whilst that's a good thing in many ways for many academics, that initial enthusiasm for doing things differently has been turned into a standard, this is how you do it online. So we've got a change in culture online in terms of what it means. Um, what that's brought for academics um, is associated our issues around productivity and monitoring in terms of surveillance by managers, you know, and how many queries have you answered, how many students have you got back to today, um, how many hours have you been online, why haven't you been online today, why aren't you showing green and available um, <clears throat> as questions and the idea of being monitored um, and seen constantly um, in a sort of panopticon, um, if you're familiar with Bentham's work, um, in terms of being seen all the time online by um, academic managers. Um, and what we started to see was a separation of online supervision, of teaching and grading as quite distinct from that academic superstar, um, the, the person whose name um, was well known to the university who was perhaps given freedoms to do what he or she would like to do. Um, whereas um, online, we were sort of seeing uh, much more buttoning down in terms of what was acceptable uh, and required by the university. <clears throat> so accompanying that, we saw a reduced contractual status starting to become associated with what we thought was almost a digital underclass, people with less privileges, less rights, um, although not less responsibility um, than some of their um, co-workers. And we noticed um, distinct undercurrents of anxieties, um, not just about being seen, uh, about having to plan 
every minute of the lesson, but also in terms of will my contract be renewed? What will happen if the student feedback isn't good? Will I be not chosen next time? Um, and what we had seen in the literature was, um, as observed by Beach, is that people in these positions were sort of undergoing what we called sticky behaviours, where they would try and make themselves uh, visible, um, such as making sure that even though they weren't paid to go to certain meetings, that they made sure that they were there so that they would be seen and observed and known to be there. Um, and it also produced a variety of mechanisms for survival and making sure that the system could be gained in their favour. Um, and we picked up quite strongly the work of Clark and Knights, although their perspective was quite different to ours in that they looked at um, established career academics and we were looking at those employed precariously on short term contracts, we, we saw a definite, I must do what's being measured rather than necessarily what is valuable. Um, and this raised all sorts of issues about um, also online in terms of recording of performance rights um, and belonging, what belongs of you in the digital space. I don't know whether anyone saw last week on Twitter, there was a case of a student who wanted to ask a professor some questions based on what they'd seen in an online class. Um, uh, contacted the university because they couldn't find that professor to find that that person actually died a few years previously but the university had continued to share the recordings of their lectures and their classes um, going forward uh, and that sort of raises other issues about um, whether you actually even need to be employed for the university to keep uh, using your resources. So um, looking at new public management and educational futures as it looked this time last year before corona and um, sort of putting a caveat there because we don't know what will happen when we come to evaluate what has happened over the last year when we've all been working online and it's produced great new ways of working less new ways of working and changes to everybody's state of being in academia. Um, what we noted in the literature was very much that neoliberal ideologies had been given a, an odd new lease of life with the implementation of digitization, which was quite surprising um, in many ways, because um, although in many ways um, neoliberalism might have been seen to be sort of in a zombie form since the financial crisis, um, it had also been sort of almost been re-envisaged um, and encouraged um, in these new frames for higher education. Um, and we saw in the literature that teaching staff were becoming managed professionals um, as opposed to independent um, knowledge um, owners and givers. Um, and we saw this sort of contrast being developed between the institutional stars and these sort of bodies keeping the wheels on and keeping the place moving, but they may not be seen and given credit by their universities. Um, and we also obviously saw this blurring of administration and um, teaching going on in the sense of work was pushed online, but with little management awareness of how much extra work that might be or how much it might take to develop an online class. Obviously that's probably going to change as we come out of the pandemic, because I think managers will be very much aware of how much, um, how many hours teaching staff have had to put in um, to online um, supports for students during this time of COVID. Um, and we'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, but there isn't an awful lot of work um, about what's going on in terms of how online identities are built um, in teaching. So it's a bit of a gap um, that we wanted to sort of research there. In terms of identity issues, um, we, we noted that um, a number of papers looked at this sort of co-creation of a state between the university and its academic staff um, and how a digital self was becoming an extension of the self. Um, and we use Beach's ideas of liminality for this transitional state online as people try to examine what it might mean 
going forward and who they were becoming to be. Um, what we felt is that we were at a bit of a crossroads. Right now we have tierings of different contracts, but what would happen in the future, we thought maybe we would see occupational stigmatizations for those unable to get um, more substantial contracts and perhaps a lower self-esteem attached to those people. Um, and we very much sort of related to Judith Butler uh, when she talked about that preserving collective defenses um, for preserving social existence, even if that's a less good social existence is what people went for um, going forward. Um, so that's a little bit about the background and what we looked at first. In terms of the practicalities of what we did, um, we did 18 semi-structured interviews as part of that longer ethnographic hanging out, which we were delighted to be able to do so in both institutions. Um, we asked the respondents to bring in several photographs to their interview, um, along with a short text describing their online academic experience as sort of framing documents. Um, they brought their own choices of images. We just asked them to bring um, between three and five images and a piece of text. And we told them very explicitly in advance that we wanted them to co-create this work with us. We wanted to hear from them as knowledgeable agents um, who were aware of what was going on and who were giving of their time and their ideas um, in a sort of positive um, sharing way. Um, we did this because we considered that people might be quite uncomfortable talking about identity work. So we wanted to be very upfront about what we were gonna ask people to talk about, um, to give them the questions in advance so that they could really think about what they were comfortable sharing and to make their stories perhaps a little bit more um, joined up and thought about as narratives than perhaps if we'd sort of surprised them. Um, and we wanted very much an atmosphere of comfort and reflection, not least because we'd, we'd shadowed some of these people, we'd sat in their lectures, we'd even been invited to speak in their lectures. So we wanted them to be as comfortable as possible um, to share their views. In terms of the responses we got, we were quite surprised by the breadth and the um, variety of um, responses we got um, to these um, questions. I mean, some people gave very, very straightforward. Here's a picture of me. I'm in my classroom. Here's the backs of my students. This is what I look like. Um, this is what my state of my desk is, as you can see. Um, somebody given a very typical uh, hodgepodge um, of a department desk. Um, but others offered um, their working tools, perhaps a poster such as we've seen today, myself and Hillary coming to give a presentation, or they put logos or office doors. You can see here that somebody has um, posted a what looks like a long corridor. Um, the word you can see there apparently is the Dutch word for joy, and that's what education meant to that participant. Um, the other one that with those sort of tiny blobs in the background was somebody who had um, been teaching online while visiting um, China, um, and those are in fact pandas in the background. Um, others made sort of metaphorical allegories of what teaching meant to them, and we've used the first one, that sort of long empty corridor, which isn't what we'd expect for students. Um, somebody else used a poster that um, the students had made for them, which was their name in Arabic. Um, others used their departmental headings and, and a wide variety of images in and around the organisation. We were very surprised and um, perhaps positively affirmed and sort of, oh, that's so interesting at the different things that people chose to share. Um, so it's a sort of documentary of a physical environment and participants within it, allowing others to imagine those human experiences underway. So in terms of the data analysis, having collected all of those photographs, um, the three of us um, undertook um, independent open coding, reading through the transcripts, sorting through the photographs and pairing them up before coming 
together. Um, we very much saw in evidence sort of plastic oral stories that bended um, and shifted according to the questioner, according to mood, um, according to the way that they felt on a particular day as, as what Boge calls anti-narrative, um, which is sort of a narrative before the narrative has become settled. So you could see them sort of slightly out of time, perhaps go, oh, I didn't think of this, going back further in time, or perhaps in the future I plan. So we saw, we didn't see a, a linear piece of time. We saw disjointed stories of um, transition and change. Uh, and what we decided to do, we, we, we then having sort of digested those second order themes, we came up with three. Attempts at materiality, so that's sort of talking about trying to leave the liminal state. Um, advantage through specialisation um, about how these individuals could become more valuable to the university because they had particular skills that others did not. Um, and this sort of um, rail politic of managing when they were working and how they were working and what trade-offs they were expected. Um, we also noted in the stories that many of them were presented dialectically. They, quite often universities were described as they, um, they did X, so I responded with Y. So what was done to them and what was done by in return. Um, Hilary, how is your connection? Are you okay to speak or do you want me to carry on? Um, tell me if you can hear me. Or um, not. I've got an unstable connection. I think I'd better carry on. I might let you to carry on. Yeah. You, you, we can understand you, but you are. <laughs> okay. We've got some comedy comments here. All right. about okay. I'm with you. you. Sound like Any questions? <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're stuck with me for the other half of the presentation. Never mind. Um, so in terms of our... Hand third... back to Fran. Yeah, all right. All so right. in terms of our findings, the first one we, we theme we talked about was a sense of materiality. We saw very different environments for our respondents between when they were physically present and that owned environment. Lots of them talked about shutting the classroom door. And even if it was only temporarily their space, it wasn't their office in a university or they didn't have um, access to a permanent space, at least when they had their students in their room, they could shut the door. Um, whereas in the digital environment, it was both intangible, but they had no sense of place in or owning the boundaries of their meeting because anyone could come in um, and drop in and drop out and they felt they had much less control in that in the intangible digital environment. There was a great deal of discomfort with this idea that anyone in the university um, could see them and I think we had sort of these sort of degrees of separation between yes it's okay it's anybody in the university but at any point any manager could drop in um, and see me teaching or see my recording and see what I said and they felt very observed and quite uncomfortable about that um, and they also praised that sort of fluid classroom setting where you know the students are working well so you can leave them to it a little bit longer or if they're struggling with something um, then um, you can give them an additional time and you have that ability to sort of share and share alike whereas online you had to follow the timetable. Um, they felt breaking and reducing bonds online. Uh, one talked about um, a severed umbilical cord because they were no longer joined to their students. Um, and, and, but we also saw a, a wish to look like they were there, sort of sticky markers of their presence um, that they did outreach work. We got one person who um, taught at a prison, so sent some pictures um, of himself um, entering the prison to go and teach. Um, or university rituals, you know, I always make sure I go to the graduation ceremony if I can get a ticket so I can spend some time with my students. Um, and they wanted to go to department meetings 
sometimes they weren't actually invited um, or they certainly weren't paid for them, but they felt they had to go to make sure that people knew that they were there and that they belonged. Um, we saw a large variety of gaps and isolation from institutional knowledge places. Sometimes they were forgotten about, sometimes they didn't receive briefings or um, where meetings were available to them, they were perhaps tucked away um, and they had to work hard to seek out knowledge that they would otherwise got um, just by being there. Um, we saw some quite different responses from those groups. Some of them very much sought to smooth those differences, sort of saying, well, I always tell the student I'll go and find out, um, but I don't always get told everything because I'm adjunct um, or I'm temporary. Others were quite rational about it in the sense that, well, I'm not going to bother investing. I've only got a three month contract. So, uh, you know, I could kill myself to do that, but I'm not going to. So you saw quite a difference in behaviours um, between those who desperately sought to belong uh, and others who tried within the bounds of what they were prepared to accept a, a very sort of satisfying approach to belonging. In terms of um, advantage through specialisation, we've got some more of the sort of classroomy pictures there. Um, people sort of putting markers of at least having their children on the wall um, and sort of a sense of place in their own study environment. And when we talked to these people, they were very, very keen to tell us about um, what skills they'd got and what they brought to the university. Um, for those who had extensive industry experience, um, they were actually falling over themselves for work. Um, the universities almost couldn't get enough of them. They were not short of um, opportunities to collaborate. And although they had very woolly contracts, because if they had access to networks in terms of um, the universities being able to draw on them for student placements, for key speakers, or for that sort of gravitas and credibility from having worked in industry, those people were very much in demand. Um, <clears throat> And those people cultivated that specialist knowledge because they wanted to look indispensable. They liked the fact that they were extremely busy and they were asked to do many, many things for their university as a representative. Um, others chose to develop online expertise, which obviously we were doing this um, field work about three years ago now. Um, so that was actually probably a really good thing to invest in. Um, uh, obviously, none of us knew where we would be today. Um, but they, they developed particular online pedagogic expertise. They sought out new platforms to try and get ahead of where the universities might be, especially for those working at more than one university. Um, and they looked at to develop critical skills for students. They felt that students were given a maze of information um, and that students' cognitive skills were not necessarily um, the strongest just because the sheer force of information that was weighing them down. So they took time <coughs> to become a sort of interpretive friend to, to help students negotiate this great wave of online availability. Um, they all felt that their skills were more measured and supervised, but every single one of them said how much more administrative work had come their way, uh, pushed their way um, and added on top of their contracts um, in, in new ways as work grew online. Um, in terms of sort of this real time responses, um, although all of them said that they got a much greater ability to reach students on the digital platforms, um, they felt that they could get to those people who never turned up. They could get to the people who perhaps wanted to come but may have been tied with caring responsibilities or perhaps had physical disabilities. Um, so they, they thought that was really good that they could get these people for the first time who perhaps had been quite isolated. All of them said how much more flexibility uh, they needed to have, that, that they felt that they needed to be on line more and available more. Um, all respondents reported a change in culture in higher education. Um, the constant criteria to support students stayed, 
Um, but the way that they were measured and judged um, had changed and developed. Um, in terms of the positives, they, they reported large audiences for appropriate events, such as library training um, or study skills. Um, but they also talked about greater numbers. Uh, one respondent was like, but I might be their special person, but if I've got a hundred people, I can't be a special person. They can't all be special to me. Uh, and they missed that, that personal relationships where they had a wider view of, you know, students' hobbies, students' lives, um, what students were like as people in that sort of reduced world. Um, and their particular concerns were about these one size fit all, fits all management rollouts. You know, we will all be doing this. This is how the teaching is going to look. This is your pack. Um, and they wanted to be individuals using their individual expertise rather than, well, this is what we're going to do for everybody. Um, and there were a great deal of concerns about practicalities um, and what those responses were um, certainly feeling that when for example they put a difficult assignment question up suddenly everybody go oh I've seen the answer on Facebook and it's x or I've seen the answer on this social platform and people say why and this whole needing to get in there very very quickly um, to make sure that students were not being led astray by social media responses um, or um, other perhaps online essay mills and other issues that they saw interfering in their classroom um, by people going out and bringing things in. Um, and they also talked about sort of different student demands from the people who kind of keep hammering you at three in the morning, like I need to respond now and they won't accept, yeah, no problem, I'll, I'll get back to you in a couple of hours. Um, to the other experience with students to this sort of going silent um, when you haven't heard from someone they've just disappeared and they've just gone and there's nothing you can do about it because there's not even a physical presence or a known person that you can track down um so the implications of, of what we found is that we saw that this was producing a great deal of identity work for these teaching academics um, they were in the process of finding out who they were becoming and why. Many of them felt that these identities were being forced upon them, um, that they had been shoveled into these online teaching formats, whether they had a particular um, interest or not. Um, but many of them adapted because they felt that they wanted to have an interaction and it was better than not having an interaction. Um, and they were seen to do tasks that were observed because they wanted some semblance of trying to maintain some control. Um, although what it meant is the parts of the self that were seen as valuable and competitive, particularly for the specialists, came to the fore very, very strongly. Um, but overall, we, we saw a group of people in, in both institutions who, who were questioning their own value and standing as academics. Um, those who were visibly coping better um, or even, cope, you know, thriving rather than just um, surviving were those undertaking little aspects of, of what we called resistance, really. They were putting together spontaneous online working groups to sort of exchange gossip and know how. Um, and the employers didn't really notice these, but they were very, very helpful and useful as communities for people who, who sought them out as teachers to share best practice um, online. So um, in terms of our main paper, um, what we're seeing is, is going back to Marx as, as a nomadic population of distributed workers. Many of them had more contracts at more than one higher education institution. Many of them had contracts in industry, um, <coughs> excuse me, who were trying to keep up um, with different bits and bats of this sort of portfolio career. Um, we felt there were a lot of questions about whose interests were being protected as a result of this work. Um, and we saw a, a huge degree of applicability um, to similar discourses from um, 
those who are employed on gig economy contracts, Uber uh, and Lyft, in terms of the behaviours that people are expected um, to undergo, the sort of um, clapping and rating for more work in the sense of the higher you were rated, the more work you got. Um, and that brought in a variety of issues in terms of sort of future steerage for labour market adaptations um, that, that we felt there were lots and lots of practical recommendations we could bring in in terms of the Taylor report for a workplace that was both fair and people had dignity because what we were seeing were people who were emotionally damaged and worried about how the future would be brought um, and we felt very much that that people hadn't and that report did not consider the emotional aspects of what this would do to people so that was our story from a year ago when we were going to come initially obviously the whole world has been thrown up in the air now um, and our current study um, we are looking at this digital teaching sphere again but in light of what covid has brought to us um, we have collected a variety of diary studies and photographs again um, to look at the changing experiences for online teaching community during this pandemic. Um, so we wanted to see what was going on at the front line, if you will. Um, we're currently um, evaluating those findings and we're doing our sort of um, data organisation, having collected all of our data. If you're interested, I've put the blog link up um because hillary's already put um a short piece on the, the wonky blog um where we started to talk about the, the themes that we've got emerging there um communication time and precarity just a little taster of what we're doing at the moment um in terms of communications we're seeing teaching staff caught between students, management and administrative systems, the, the sort of hands are mangled in the wheels. Um, we're seeing obviously cancellations of exams last summer um, and changing rules causing mass confusion for students that very often the people who were trying to sort that out were people on very tiny contracts who were not paid um, to sort of under, under, undo what, it, what the institutional communication meant. Um, they felt out there in the digital space because the offices were closed. They had even less communication with a tangible university than they already had. So they were very much making up policy decisions by themselves on their own um, and hanging in there. And what we saw were um, the reporting was sort of student pleas for help, huge volumes of emails with massive um, emotional outpourings and their own personal you know not just the student stories of grief but their own stories of grief so what we saw there were people working in very heart-wrenching conditions I mean obviously nothing on what was happening in the NHS um, but um, they felt at the sharp end with with little support uh, and they felt that management had retreated um, and we're not reaching out to them as staff to say how were they, but what they where they did find solace was again in their communities of peers, the comradeship of their other colleagues getting through it together. Um, the the, pic, the photograph we've chosen there is um, from Uzbekistan, where one respondent um, drew that one as a kind of it fits the times, everything's slightly askew, I'm framing it, I'm reframing it, I'm framing it again, and things keep changing, but they're not quite straight, and they're not quite as they should be. Um, the second theme um, of time, the photograph we chose here of the runner's road, endless and unknowing, people just don't know when this is going to stop. Um, I mean, it was, they felt it was useful for keeping healthy as a positive, but it's great expanse of unknown road ahead. They felt that their time management skills and, and regular rhythms of how they did their work had become really quite elastic, particularly for those who had um, children at home and were trying to homeschool uh, whilst teaching higher education students. So we saw that sort of, well, I could do that from seven in the morning till nine, and then I can do that one from nine till three, and then I can get on with that one. And, and this sort of, and I'm sure we're all gonna laugh at this one, this online 
fatigue um, becoming an issue in and of itself with the computer becoming the marker of time rather than real life experiences for people. Um, and I'm sure you can all relate to the uh, pair of shoes with one respondent offering her old carpet slippers, asking when will I ever get out of these? Um, they, they, they were worried about the future of their employment. Uh, they were worried about their organisation or future in the sense that they didn't know how the pandemic would affect um, student numbers or student recruitment, that they didn't know um, what that would mean for their, um, their future selves and their future students' mental health and their own. Um, but what they did report on the positive is having made the adjustments that they felt that people, particularly their students, had become kinder and more tolerant and for the perhaps the first time since they'd moved online were relating to the online person as perhaps a, a real person in that way and I've just put a few references there so that's the end of my slides um Brett I'm going to hand back to you for a moment yes thanks Fran for a really engaging and interesting presentation um sorry we couldn't hear a bit more from um Hillary, and you had to give perhaps more of the presentation than you'd originally bargained for, but uh, it was very engaging all the way through. So uh, this is the point of the seminar where we invite questions. So if you have questions, perhaps you can first of all, either turn your microphone on and put your hand up, your webcam on and put your hand up, or uh, write it into the chat box, um, and we'll find a way to allow you to ask the question. Okay. Um, I mean, I had a question to begin with, um, since people are obviously still thinking a little bit. You were, you were talking about digital uh, frames giving the neoliberal ideas a new lease of life in this kind of, you, you recall that, that that was kind of surprising. Um, and yet you talked a lot, that was at, in the start of your presentation, yet you talked a lot about how this was presented very dialectically in terms of Oh, the university did this, so I've responded like this. So to what extent do you think in these responses, you do you think that the respondents are really accepting um, the neoliberal ideas of the university? Or are they are they increasingly infuriated or aggravated or wanting to fight back against them? Oh, gosh, that's a loaded question. Um, we felt very much that there was a great deal of um they were divided into two camps to, to me and hillary probably have her own thoughts there as well if, if she's able to <laughs> she might be communicating by text but certainly that they were sort of felt between the sort of those who were accepting it who felt there was nothing they could do um and those who had got angry and then decided to see what they could do about it and there was those pockets uh, of resistance that we saw um with people sort of starting their own little online um, networks to exchange information, bitch about the university um, and, and generally sort of, oh, have you seen there's a job there or a variety and, and sort of try and exert some agency, even if it was no more than kind of, well, I've had a contract for last year, for next year, um, has, um, anyone else you know sharing information and making sure that there wasn't the poor person in the dark who had neither had a contract nor so to, to make sure that people weren't left behind um and hillary's tight yeah an element of compliance and those who resisted and started their own conversations very much so um but then we saw another group who were just well i'll make the best of it uh, i do what i can um, interestingly, I would have said that the people who made the best of it were also divided into two camps. We had the people who were, um, as Hillary's saying, were quite browbeaten um, and quite depressed about it. But then that group was also subsetted between those people who had plenty of industrial work as well, who worked as trainers. And because they had other outlets where they were respected and seen face to face and were doing other consultancy work, they were kind of, well, that's fine. I'll do what I can. I don't like it, but I'll get on with it. So in effect, three groups of people, um, those who were resisting, those who had a, um, a sort of 
well, it's okay because there's plenty of other work and there's lots of other stuff to do. And then, as Hilary's saying, um, there is a great deal of people who just feel real fear and a sense of what will happen to me going forward. Um, I'll go to Fiona's question next, unless there's anything else that you wanted to add to that, Brett. Uh, no, that's a very interesting answer. Thank you. I mean, it's simply the fact that when you think of Uber, it's so dispiriting, isn't it? But on the other hand, there are these little shoots of encouraging signs when it comes to these kind of little network trade unions that are not very traditional at all, kind of suddenly starting to spring up everywhere. So, yeah. I, I think we would see that in terms of certainly UCU membership has gone up um, exponentially in the last couple of years as people have sort of, well, join your union. <laughs> Um, you know, there's not much you can do, but at least for some people who felt they couldn't say anything, at least by joining their union, they felt they were doing something. Um, in terms just to say, if people who are typing on uh, the chat, um, if they want to say whether they want to ask the question in person or not, that would be useful. But Fiona's um, clearly asked a very interesting question. Shall I read it? Um, so basically, Fiona's interested in the use of photos for interviews as they haven't done that before. Um, can you say anything more about why you use them and the difference you think it made to your data? Um, I mean, Hillary started to answer that question that there's a great text which I've put in the in the references from Pink um, in terms of um, this idea of using photog photographs because it allows people to choose and frame what they want to say um, and sort of to refer back to us so in a sense by bringing in a photograph they were owning part of the interview um, in a way that they wouldn't be if they were just reacting to what we said um, we used a little bit from Bart camera Lucida to talk about the sort of um, what he calls the sort of punctum in the photograph which is the bit of meaning in terms of the composition the bit that draws your eye the bit that you are um, drawn to and the way that um, our participants chose to construct themselves um, in the photograph. So what we, what we tried to get through there based on the work of Pink was this idea of themselves being agents. Um, and we think that, the, that the, what that did for our data is it gave a real life to it um, and a sense of sort of co-creation rather than we were the writers um, and, you know, in that sense, because they were owning it and they were saying, this is what I chose. This is why I chose it. Um, and this is what it did for me. Um, so that was good. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Fiona. That's really great. Um, if you wanted to drop me a line, I can send you a few of the papers if you're interested that we used a lot of um, and some of the references that we've got there. Um, we've also started to use a couple of um, other papers using for our next study because we want to use photographs again. There's quite a few about sort of changes in a physical environment to what that means to an online, an online going forward. Um, so we've got anything you can share about using identity. Um, I yeah um i think identity is quite interesting as a topic it's become very popular i would certainly think the work of caroline clark is a great place to start in terms of academic identity um and ibima um in terms of how people create identities um i would say that it works on sort of three or four levels perhaps the sort of personal micro identities um, that people would have in uh, in their, you know, as a whether you're sort of in a, in a, um, an environment of the family is quite perhaps quite different to at work. So people might wear, have half a dozen identities in a standard working day, for example. So you're quite a different person um, when you're at home as a mum, as a dad, or even as a child if you've got a parent. Um, to the person that you are at work, you might put your coat on. Um, to um, sort of go and present to the boss, which is effectively a physical uh, marker of an identity that you are putting on as opposed to the one you might have when you're chatting in the canteen. Um, so um, that's quite interesting from there. But absolutely, as Hilary says, Nick Beach is really interesting in terms of identity work. Um, but we also have 
sort of group identity and corporate identity work, the work of Andrew Brown, I think is really interesting um, on this sphere. So yes, certainly. Um, we're getting a few emails down there. I'll try and write those down unless, um, Dee, are you able to scribble those um, emails down for us? Well, I'm at yeah, I'm sure we'll... We don't, um, don't worry, uh, it's Rebecca, hey, don't worry. Um, we, we'll have a text, uh, a transcript of the um, chat at the end so we can pick these emails up then. Great, because Hilary and I have got quite a batch of decent papers, which would be a good start for anybody who's um, thinking of doing a bit of work in this field. Save you a bit of time. <laughs> um, so Kyung Mi has said that she'd like to ask a question. And I think Kyung Mi's going to do that by video. Okay, cool. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for uh, the lovely presentation. It was very interesting. Um, I have a two question. One can be quite quick, and then one can be a bit, a bit more like need needing a bit more unpacking. But probably uh, start with the kind of quick one is that those kind of idea of panopticon, is it really happening to those staff members who are teaching online, or it's just that they're kind of on fear? of they may be observed by management teams so they kind of correct their behaviors rather than so do you have any example that actually people are really um tracked down because of they're not online and that has any disadvantage to their um uh, so that's a good question uh yeah sorry um absolutely it was happening we had some um a number of people who showed instances where managers had chased them where perhaps they weren't you know you haven't been online for three days um or you have not responded um hillary's just posted up that they do analytics of length of tutorials much as your tutorial visit in the old days somebody would come and say i'm going to come and see your tutorial um and they'd put their head around the door and you'd have a chat and have perhaps of a coffee at the end that very peer-to-peer -peer collegiate um tutorial visiting had moved to a, an inspection so it was like we noted that six students attended your tutorial we noted it lasted for sex num x number of, uh, of hours we noted that you covered the following things please put the following improvements so we saw a real change in the tone um if that helps with your question yeah that's that sounds really terrible but Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, the second question is that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, because like it's University A and B, I, I can get it. So I'm not going to go deeper about it. But it's, um, I mean, I just only guess that one can be just distance education institute that where everyone is teaching online pretty much. And the another one is traditional university trying to have this unit of teaching online. So do, do you find any huge difference between like institution A and institution B and how the people are treated in the setting? Oh, um, it's a really good question. <laughs> um, when we started work with the first institution, there was a mix of face to face and online work. And those who had got face to face um, were kind of seen as a bit lucky. Um, obviously, as time has gone on, that has disappeared. So that whole element of kind of, well, I, you know, I'm doing face to face, which is great, as opposed to when I got online again. And we saw it all moving online. What we saw in the other university is a definite underclass um, in terms of people who have felt, oh, we'll get them to fill in. Um, and um, people, we talked to a couple of profs who were, well, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Because or where they felt they had negotiated. Um, certainly, there's one interaction I, I saw where uh, an administrator put their head around the door and it was like, "Well, could you do this?" And the prof was kind of like, "Well, I'll swap you. I'll take that, but then you're someone else will have to do this." So because they had more power and were in a senior position, they were able to negotiate. Whereas when we saw some of the people who some of the people who were perhaps working as adjuncts were very much, "You take what you can get." So we saw a definite, those people who felt they could negotiate and they, those people were in a much stronger, they seemed healthier and, and seemed to have more resilience because they were able to sort of, well, I don't mind doing, you know, I'll take the third years 
but that means I lose first year accounting or whatever it was that they checked that they would prefer not to do, um, which is quite interesting. Thank you so much. And Hilary says the haves and the have nots, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I, what's interesting in terms of COVID is whether that's all gone back up in the air now and we might see some things building back better in terms of because we've all had to go online hopefully some of those profs who were a bit more resistant to teaching online because they didn't want to because everybody's had to might be a bit more a bit kinder to those people who are looking after them going forward but we'll have to see um, are there new regulation strategies in both institutions? Um, it's a traditional. I, I can't really answer that question to be fair because we haven't been back to the traditional institute since um, that one was overseas. Um, so we, we haven't been back um, since, although it's a really good question. Um, in terms of regulation strategies, can you think of, yeah. Not to our knowledge, we didn't really see any changes yet. I think that question will be a really great one to ask in a year's time when everybody emerges from let's just deal with the front line to how are we going to go forward. So I think that's a really great question to ask in a year. In fact, I'm going to write that one down. Um, um, can I ask a question that kind of follows on from Sedgins, but it's um, it's partly motivated by your focus early in the presentation on enclosures. And digital enclosures um, because the enclosures of course were an attempt to throw people off of land and say where you couldn't go now in some work I've been doing that's about COVID teaching actually some of the issues that staff have been talking about is saying where they have to be mm. or about saying where you have to go on to it's about um, laying down the perimeters of around you rather than saying where you can't be and saying you can't use systems that the university hasn't approved you can't have an online footprint that the university doesn't control various reasons are offered for that in the uk it might be well we don't know if that system's accessible or something like that right now that research hasn't been done with um staff in, in the same position as yours they're not so precarious and so on and you've said that these staff are you know they're having multiple jobs they're all over the place they're trying to find new places to have an online identity so how is the university trying to restrict them doing that do you think and is there an extent that the university is forcing them to be in a certain place online i think in if we i mean perhaps it's pushing the analogy of that online enclosure a little far but in terms of the technologies that people were first you know once we suddenly got bigger fields um and you've got the advent of the industrial revolution tools and you know you can no longer push the plow by hand you will have to use not quite the combine harvester but you're getting the idea in terms of whether people did not want um i don't want to use the word luddite but in terms of people did not always want to use um the new technologies to move harder and faster but they had to because otherwise they would not remain competitive and they wouldn't get paid um, by the landowners. Um, certainly restricted in, in Zoom. Um, what's been quite interesting is that different universities have obviously got different platforms and different ways of being and people have been, you must learn this new technology and this is the one that we're using. Whereas I think certainly 10 years ago for people who were doing it, there was an ability to say, I like this one, so I'm going to use this tool. So what we're seeing is a standardization within each individual university uh, of what they're going to use and where they're being restricted in my view. But uh, this, these are fascinating questions and I think we're gonna see so much coming back when people get a chance to breathe when this is all over and say, okay, which ones did we like? Which ones do we not like? Um, certainly um, one of our institutions is using Adobe Connect and management have bought in this whole, you must clear the room after you leave. And there's very much a sort of feeling of, um, but I like my room the way it is. I like to organize my online breakout areas and my chat box in the way that I like it, um, rather than this whole, I have to go back to standard. So I can't even own my own digital space. And I, I felt that was quite strong um, for certain people. Another one from Sajin. I wonder whether the relationship between neoliberal strategies and digital when the former is conquering the latter. I'd say it, it's so surprising to me that, that 
neoliberalism um, is is sort of flourishing like it's a new thing. Um, and, and I'm very struck by how powerless um, we have been to this sort of marketization of our spaces as individual academics. And maybe it's because we were so busy working, we didn't really notice it creeping up on us until it became to a point where, um, as, as Sajin has just said, the former is conquering the latter. Okay, thank you, Fran, for some very, very um, interesting answers to questions. Uh, one of those seminars, which is often the point of having a seminar, where the answers to the questions are at least as important as the presentation, you know, to think, see where this is going forward and your thinking on this. Well, uh, I've certainly made a series of notes for things to think about next. <laughs> Going well, forward. you'll be able to watch the recording, which uh, which uh, <laughs> it's always an interesting thing to watch a recording of yourself. Okay, um, I think we've exhausted the questions on the chat box. It was slightly chaotic by the end with people typing lots of little things. Um, so if I missed any, then um, please paste it again now. But I think we got them all. Um, so I'd like to thank Fran and Hillary for a very interesting presentation. It was it was great, and it's great that your paper's out in teaching and higher education. Um, I shall certainly be going away and reading that afterwards. Okay. Um, so thank you very much. The recording for this seminar will be available, as I said at the beginning, on the uh, department's YouTube channel fairly soon, and then that will be put uh, through onto the department's um, web page. So. People will be able to relive this, if, even if you are here. Um, I'd like to end, us, end this event by saying that the next online seminar in this series is going to be held on Wednesday, the 10th of February, and that will be presented by Dr. Tony Adams from the Department of Communication at Bradley University in Illinois, whose title is The Art of Autoethnography. Okay. So thank you very much to everyone who came and thanks once again <coughs> to uh, Fran and Hilary. Well, thank you so much for having us. It was a great pleasure and we really enjoyed um, doing a presentation. So thank you so much for everybody. And thank you for the great questions. I've wrote them down as places to um, <laughs> investigate going further. Um, as I say, hopefully um, the folks at Lancaster will send me those emails and then I'll send you some papers um, based on what, what you might find interesting reading going forward.